All right, so welcome again to the Gippsland New Energy Forum, uh, brought to you by the Committee for Gippsland in partnership with the Gippsland Climate Change Network. Um, I'm going to be your host for the day. I'm Scott Ferraro. I'm the Program Director of Monash's, Monash University's Net Zero Initiative. Um, so that's an initiative trying to get uh, all of Monash's uh, operations to, to zero emissions. Um, uh, formal, formerly, I was the inaugural Executive Officer of the Gippsland Climate Change Network. Um, so some 10 years ago, um, I really did enjoy my time working, working down in the region and I'm very excited to see uh, a lot of things happening in the discussion uh, like this uh, still happening in the region, which is, which is fantastic. Um, so I'd like to acknowledge the Gunai Kurnai people, the traditional custodians of the land on which we're virtually gathered today. Uh, pay my respects to their elders, uh, both past, present and emerging. And given the nature of things in 2020 that we're gathered virtually, I'd also like to acknowledge uh, the traditional custodians from wherever you are zooming in from today as well. Um, so a bit, of, a bit of context for um, this, uh, this forum today. Um, there's a lot, a lot changing in the energy sector, both within Australia and globally. We're seeing a lot of, lot of trends playing out, both uh, from an environmental perspective in terms of climate, um, but we're also seeing uh, rapid changes in technology, both on the supply side and the demand side. And we've got shifts in global markets uh, for energy demand and export commodities as well. Um, in this context, I guess Gippsland has been central to Victoria's uh, energy system and underpinning Victoria's energy system. And now there's the opportunity to understand how Gippsland can build off this expertise and capability to really capture this emerging opportunity um, to establish itself as a clean energy hub. Um, hopefully a number of you have seen the Victorian budget released earlier in the week, um, and we've seen record investment uh, flow into the clean energy sector um, as part of the uh, bounce back strategy from COVID, um, but also to help deliver on the state's uh, net zero emissions target by 2050, which it has in place. So this is an opportune time to have this discussion, really think about how Gippsland can position itself um, in this new order. So we've got a great lineup of speakers for today. So you won't be hearing too much from me. I'll be facilitating some Q&A as we go. Um, so we've got Jane Oakley from the Committee for Gippsland, Erin Coldham from Star of the South, Jeremy Stone from J Power, uh, King Arthur from Solus Renewable Energy, and Chris Barfoot from the Gippsland Climate Change Network. So we're looking to facilitate a discussion. So please do use the Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom screen um, to post your questions. And I'll ask a number of these questions once we've heard from each of our speaker. So they'll have 10 minutes each to present and then we'll have five minutes following each presentation for Q&A. And depending on how good I play host today, um, we should have some time for Q&A at the end of this session as well. Um, and our speakers will be able to answer your questions in the Q&A function um, as well. So let's get stuck into it. I'm going to throw over to our first speaker today. So that is Jane Oakley, the CEO of the Committee for Gippsland. Um, so over to you, Jane. Thanks so much, Scott. Uh, thanks for the opportunity. Firstly, before I start, I'd just like to acknowledge the partnership with uh, the Gippsland Climate Change Network and um, the Chair Darren McCubbin and his team. It's a fantastic opportunity. Yesterday, I was fortunate enough to participate in a panel discussion on the HESC project, which you'll hear more about from Jeremy Stone today. Um, but what's exciting, Scott touched on this, was the Victorian government's budget announcement and there was a huge focus on clean energy, which is really paramount for Gippsland. When you think of Gippsland, we've had a dominance in the energy sector for a number of decades, you know, 100 years, and we want to obviously maintain that reputation, that powerhouse reputation. And we acknowledge that we're on a journey of transitioning from our traditional energy industry to new and emerging and a clean um, clean energy sort of focus. So pleasing of the in the budget was the announcements around hydrogen. Um, you know, some of the work that the committee is doing at the moment, we've just recently put in a submission to NERA 
and um, that submission is to be recognised as a regional hydrogen cluster. So we'll, we will be, if we're successful, one of a few hydrogen clusters responsible for production, commercialisation and exploring new clean technologies as part of um, driving Australia's hydrogen future, clean hydrogen future. So we're very excited to sort of wait. We should know by tomorrow as to whether our submission has been successful. And we have 70 organisations who have registered to be part of the Gippsland Regional Hydrogen Cluster. Um, and they are represented from not only within Gippsland, but across Australia and some overseas companies as well. So we look forward to that coming to fruition. The other good um, announcements in the Victorian budget, budget, which is some work also being explored by Committee for Gippsland is the Renewable Energy Zone. And many would um, be familiar with that. And I think some ongoing sessions are required with these sort of energy forums to raise the awareness about what a res is. Um, so, you know, we're one of six in Victoria, so it's fairly competitive. And I think there's some work to be done in Gippsland in terms of improving the profile of organisations like AEMO about the res in Gippsland and what it has to offer and the potential of solar and wind, both offshore and onshore capability within Gippsland. Um, there's also what we plan to do with these workshops is run a series of workshops in, in next year around new energy, new clean energy, and start to sort of raise people's awareness across Gippsland about our future. It's really important that we have a really clear plan in terms of our energy transition from where we are today. We've got, you know, a sector that's really sort of held us together, a primary sector, and now it's about how do we sort of continue to evolve and grow and protect the GDP that we contribute and the jobs that um, make sure that we're a thriving region moving forward. So look, I'm gonna close here because I don't wanna take too much time in this conversation. I really wanna hear from our, our wonderful panel members and share with you further insight as to the potential opportunities happening across Gippsland. It's a really exciting time for our region and I hope you enjoy the session. We look forward to interacting and having a good robust discussion at the conclusion of the presentations. Thank you. Thanks, Scott. Perfect, Jane. And before you disappear, there's been um, one question come in from Paul Stansfield, which you might be able to answer. Um, and that's with regards to TAFE, um, whether it will be engaged to teach future technicians and operators for changes in this space as well. It's a really great question. It came up yesterday, this whole skills sort of transition part of the, the story, the new energy, clean energy future. And TAFE, along with the university and RTOs, will be instrumental in skilling up jobs of the future in energy. So, you know, there's a lot of work happening at the moment. The TAFE, along with the university and some of the RTOs, are part of our cluster submission as well. Um, and it is about really working with industry as it stands today and also future and emerging industries. So I know lots of work's taken place with Erin at Star of the South in terms of what are the future skills needs in the offshore wind sort of sector. So yes, the TAFE will play an instrumental role in developing future skills. Perfect. Thank you, Jane. And lovely segue uh, to our next speaker as well. Um, so next up, we've got Aaron Coldham, who's the Chief, De Chief Development Officer for Star of the South. And um, I think you'll all agree with me, this is a large scale project, not just for Gippsland and Victoria, but Australia and globally as well. So over to you, Aaron. Great, thank you, Scott and Jane. Um, I think this is, before I start, just to acknowledge such an exciting time for Gippsland. And as Jane said, there's so much going on, it's almost hard to keep up with the new announcements around the new energy opportunities. And we're really grateful that we can be a part of that. And so I just wanna thank the Committee for Gippsland as well as Gippsland Climate Change Network for putting on forums like this that allow us to come and share a little bit of how we can play a role in this transition, um, but equally to meet more of you and have that input as we say, because Projects like this, like our Star of the South, it's, it's one that we're very excited about, but it really is something that we wanna work with communities as well as industry and government to get the best result for the region. So today I've got a few slides. I'm gonna go into uh, really a little bit of the what and why just briefly, because I know a lot of you have heard uh, some general presentation material from us before. 
but then I'll focus on what is that economic opportunity? What could this look like as part of HIPS plan, new clean energy future? So just starting a little bit of a recap, as I mentioned, um, for those of you who are not familiar with our project, we have a map here, which is essentially an area off the coast of Gippsland, down near Port Albert, Yarram, McLaughlin's Beach, uh, where you can see we've got an exploration area where we're basically out there looking at the opportunity to put these offshore wind turbines in the ocean, which we think can play a really strong role in shoring up Victoria's energy supply going forward as well as uh, help contribute to the economic um, prospects of the region. What you can see on the map is also some transmission routes that we're looking into. So some of you might be familiar earlier this year, we announced some routes where we might connect that uh, offshore wind resource up into the Latrobe Valley. And primarily that's one of the main attractions of why there's all of this investment and all of this investigation going on right now in Gippsland, off in Commonwealth waters, is because of that very strong infrastructure and the strong skills of the region to be able to input new energy. And we're talking at quite a large scale. We're investigating uh, up to 2.2 gigawatts to sort of put that into perspective around 20% of the state's energy needs. Uh, but as we say, the Gippsland and Latrobe Valley is the perfect place given the, the capability and the existing infrastructure that can support that kind of new generation, particularly as older generation starts to come offline over the coming decades. Uh, I've also got a, a picture here, which, you know, it just amazes me every time I see photos of these offshore wind farms. This is one from Europe uh, under construction. You can see the, the ship there, the jack-up vessel putting the blade in. And if you look closely in the background there, all of those turbines so when we say, what is, what is the offshore wind farm? Um, we're seeing a lot of fast growth overseas and I'll, I'll come back to that in a minute in terms of how that could translate for Gippsland. Very briefly, I just wanted to touch on why, because again, it, it's very important. Why are we looking at offshore wind? I often get asked, you know, Australia is a big country. We can keep building a lot of onshore wind and solar. We don't, you know, do we really need to go offshore? That sounds a lot more complicated. Uh, it is true, but I think what we're seeing is that this change from uh, very strong traditional forms of power generation, which have been very reliable in the past, and, and this move towards a more variable resource, so knowing that the weather patterns play a strong role in how much can be generated from these new technologies, we believe it's really important to have a mix of technologies, so not just um, one or the other, we're going to need everything to shore up our energy security going forward. But equally, we're going to need some geographic diversification. So what you can see on the map here, it's a little bit what Jane said, and it's certainly been really interesting um, delving into a lot of these plans that are being done by the market operator and, and various governments in terms of where that new generation is coming online. And what we're seeing is a lot of wind being built out in the west of Victoria on land where there's some strong resources. Uh, but as you can see, not a lot in the east. And where we think there's a real opportunity is to tap into a different weather pattern that's very much connected to the times where the grid's under the most stress. So we actually, it was a new discovery this year, we went and looked at basically 30 years worth of data from the Bureau of Meteorology. And we found a really strong link between those hot days where it gets to 35, 40 degrees, uh, where the system starts to come under stress with everyone turning the air conditioners on. That is actually the time that the offshore wind is blowing at its absolute strongest out in Bass Strait. So we think there's some really good scientific research and evidence that suggests offshore wind is going to play a really important role going forward in terms of Victoria's energy security, but also keeping prices under control. I'll briefly touch on some of our current activities, and this is really our core focus at the moment. So our project is in feasibility. We're not ready to um, start letting construction contracts and go out there and building the project. And what we're focused on is understanding what are we dealing with, what's under the ocean. So we've got a whole run range of scientists. You can see some of them represented here in terms of which ones are going to be um, you know, which species do we need to be mindful of? So we've got quite a few local vessels out there investigating different aspects at the moment. And just to run through some pictures, uh, there's, you know, here's some of the things we're finding. These are, um, it, it, as I said, always amazes me. And what we need to do with a project like this is make sure we fully understand that 
marine environment, um, the bird, the migratory paths, there's going to be several years worth of data collection and environmental assessments to make sure that any project that is developed is done sensibly and with environmental impacts in mind. So here's just some of the pictures. Um, the marine environment, this was just taken recently. Um, we've got vessels out there at the moment doing what we call benthic surveys. Uh, so looking at the sea floor, what's down there, you can see a bit of, um, uh, of what's, what's beneath the surface. Fish diversity surveys, this has also been fascinating. Um, here you can see pictures from gummy shark and moray eel. Um, if you're interested in this sort of thing, we actually publish quite a lot of information. We're trying to be quite transparent about this research and I encourage you to follow some of our social media channels. Um, interestingly, we found a, an interesting video the other day of an octopus and a shark coming together and having a bit of a tussle. Um, so there's certainly some interesting findings that we're coming across at this current phase. We've got our wind and wave monitoring happening out there. So these are really um, going to be out there for two years, measuring the wind and the waves and essentially telling us what kind of turbines we might have, what's most suitable for that wind profile. Um, and community. So um, this is another really important part of the project. And I encourage anyone on this call who lives in Gippsland and wants to have some contribution to the project. It's really just to highlight that this is a project we want to develop with community input uh, as part of the, the process from the full way. So this is our community advisory group. We've got people represented all across Gippsland and there was a huge amount of interest in this group. Um, we had about 40 applications. So I just wanted to say I'm really excited to be working on a project in Gippsland where there are so many passionate people who want to get involved and see good outcomes for their region. So that group will keep meeting for the next uh, several years as we plan the project. Uh, importantly, if you want to drop in, we've got a Gippsland office. So we, uh, we did have some disruptions with COVID, but thankfully we are reopening, I'm happy to say, in a couple of weeks. So down in Yarram, we'll do lots of promotion around that. Um, but again, just wanted to give that a plug for those in the area who want to drop in and see us and have a bit more of an individual conversation. Okay, moving into the, the main theme of this forum. And once again, I just want to touch on this industry because I have been fascinated as an Australian uh, who has been working in an offshore wind industry for about nearly three years. Just the fast growth that's happening globally in offshore wind is absolutely incredible. And it's been driven by a lot of strong targets from countries, um, particularly in Europe, but what we're seeing now in, in Asia, um, remarkable growth and interest in offshore wind. So we're really lucky here that we've been able to attract some international investment that's going towards our feasibility studies. Um, but equally that we've got a few workers from Europe who, who know what this in offshore wind industry can do, know how to maximise local benefits for the countries where it's being built. And um, there's some really interesting examples. So one of them is um, Humber, so Hull in the UK. That has been completely transformed um, from a regional town that was uh, facing an uncertain future. There were some question marks with the decline of oil and gas industries and the commercial fishing industries, what the future of those townships looked like. And uh, if you, you know, there's some fantastic videos out there on the internet. If you get a chance, have a look because it's been transformed into an absolute clean energy powerhouse. Um, the UK government has set a target for 40 gigawatts of offshore wind by 2030. Just to put that into perspective, there's only um, about 24 gigawatts installed around the world. So they've got some huge targets and we do expect there's going to be growth around 230 gigawatts uh, within the next 10 years around the world. So we really want Australia to get a slice of that pie. We want, want to make sure that we're getting that technology here and the international interest and the investment that can benefit our local communities. And it's stories like this that make it really important. So it's not just about, you know, numbers and seeing, you know, what can be done and contracts. There's real life people. And this is one that I love. This is a guy called Craig. He works for Tech Ocean. Um, and it's an example how we can bring that international experience and combine that with local know-how to create ongoing employment. So Craig is someone who goes out, uh, was involved with the deployment of our floating LiDAR devices. This was technology from France. And, and they came out, they stayed in the pubs, the motels, um, really enjoyed being part of that Gippsland community for those few weeks and trained up these local workers in how to service this equipment. 
Um, and as you can see, you know, we've got a quote here from Craig, but it's just one example how already in the development phase, we're trying to find ways that we can transition into these new industry and job opportunities where um, these people haven't had the opportunity previously. And that leads into some of the modelling that we've done. And essentially what we've done, because we get asked this question a lot, and just to put it into perspective, we probably get um, you know, up to 10 emails a week of people asking, when, when is the job coming? When can I work on the offshore wind farm? So we thought, look, we really need to understand what does this job opportunity look like? So we did some modelling on a, uh, an offshore wind farm up to the size of 2.2 gigawatts, like what we're considering and um, found that based on the experience internationally and the capabilities that exist in, in Gippsland and Victoria and, and Australia more broadly, that um, we do see these sort of numbers of employment as being possible. And when you think back to what Jane was saying around the, the GDP and the region's economy, it's a project like this could be really quite significant. Um, in terms of investment numbers, $6.4 billion in, of investment into the economy over the life of the project. And it's not just direct employment on the job. There's many opportunities in the downstream supply chain, which I'll talk to shortly, over a 30 year operational life that would need to service this um, wind farm out at sea. I've just got here a few typical jobs in offshore wind. So um, this isn't all of the types of jobs, but sometimes people ask us, well, what type of skills do you need? And at a high level, we think there's good opportunities for workers from existing sectors in Gippsland, as I say, whether that's electricity generation, uh, oil, gas, fishing, uh, to transition into this industry. So you've got um, electrical and mechanical skills, which are highly sought after in the offshore wind industry. Um, the types of jobs, high voltage cable joiners, as you can see here during that construction phase, with those electrical trades, and marine coordinators, so based onshore but overseeing marine operations out at sea, wind turbine technicians. That's really where there's a lot of opportunity, as I say, over the long term life of the project, because these are 24 7 operations. Every day you'll see vessels going out to service uh, these machines and make sure everything's going fine and all of the support that goes with that. In terms of typical procurement opportunities, again, a lot of companies in the region saying, well, how can I get involved? What sort of um, components might you need? And, and this just explains the approach. So Star of the South, we're here as the developer. Um, we will look to have a series of what we call tier one contracts. So usually that's the wind turbine generator, the foundations, the cables, the transmission, both onshore and offshore. And typically they're the very large high level contracts. And you know, what we need to acknowledge is a lot of that that know-how does, particularly the wind turbine generators, there's only about three or four in the whole world that can um, essentially lead those contracts, but then there's different components within them. And a key priority for us is ensuring that there's a good link between any of these tier one contracts and every, every single service and piece of equipment that might be required, um, which leads into this slide in terms of how can we actually source that locally. So just like we're in a feasibility and investigations phase in the actual, you know, looking out at what's in the ocean, we're also in an information gathering and a discovery phase of what can we do for jobs and industry. And I'm glad someone brought up TAFE. Um, we're having good discussions with TAFE and Federation Uni and all of the training institutions. How can we lay the groundwork now? How can we get the foundations right so that we can make the most out of this future market? because we are a long-term project. You know, construction wouldn't start for another, you know, it's hard to speculate now, but towards the middle of this decade uh, with power coming in towards the end of the decade. So how can we get industry ready now? So we're in a good position. And this just outlines some of the things that we're doing. We do have an industry capability network uh, page live, there's a portal there. I think we have about 300 businesses registered. If you're not on there, I do encourage you to get on board and have a look at it. Um, we've also published an Australian industry participation plan through the Department of Industry federally. And we're talking with a lot of industry bodies. And this is, again, where I love the passion from Gippsland. We've just listed a few of them here, but there's many, many more, um, as well as unions and others that we're really keen to speak to. So we can do that proper mapping of the skills and make those connections, as I say, between the international suppliers who've got the experience to bring that local know-how. And we'll, this you know, is going to only ramp up over the next few years. So certainly encourage those of you involved in this 
aspect um, of wanting to get more involved in um, contracts and jobs and what those opportunities of the future look like, please do um, follow our channels. We send out monthly email updates. We've got social media so that you know when we're having those conversations and can get involved. Um, and just, I'll, I might stop sharing, but before I finish, I just want to um, again reiterate how excited we are about this potential opportunity. And as I say, it's a long-term project. There's a lot of work to go and we're really working hard on all of the aspects that need to come to fruition. But we've been really encouraged recently and just to give a shout out to both the federal government and the state government. Uh, in the federal government this year, they allocated $4.8 million to put the regulatory framework in place for offshore clean energy projects. I think that's fantastic. Um, so we're really, really pleased with how that regulatory work's going. And only this week, we saw um, a commitment to a new uh, fund. I believe it's, it's to do with innovation in clean energy, which specifically mentioned offshore wind. So a, a $108 million commitment from the Victorian government looking at technologies of the future, such as offshore wind, hydrogen, um, low emissions vehicles. So you know, just in closing, I think it's, it's a nice way to summarise that even though um, these technologies are not here being built next year and, and needed for the next few years, it's really fantastic that a lot of that long-term planning is starting to really gain some momentum, um, which helps us with our studies and our investment going forward. Sorry, back to you, Scott. Brilliant, Thank, thanks, Erin. Um, yeah, I think that's that's very exciting uh, to see such a large scale um, and in-depth process going on to, to set it up as well. So we've had lots of questions come in. I think a number of them you've answered as you've gone and you'll also be able to uh, answer uh, as you as you type, a couple I might just pick out um, in terms of will this be a, a once-off sort of project for you guys, or are you looking at other opportunities across Australia? And then I guess a, a, another question of could there be more than one of these types of wind farms in Victoria as well? Yeah, I think certainly um, what we've seen over the last year, I would say, is a couple of other offshore wind projects being explored. One over in Western Australia. Um, and off the coast of New South Wales around Newcastle. So it's seeming to get a little bit of traction. That's not um, ourselves specifically, but I think in general, there's other opportunities for offshore wind. And we're actually doing some more uh, modeling and um, gathering some more intelligence in how we can get some synergies with that broader industry. I do think in Gippsland, there's um, one of the things that you need for offshore wind is suitable sea depths. So usually that's between around 20 and 40 meters. And um, that's essentially the site that we're looking at. And, and equally, um, you know, there might be staging or, or other projects that come into that sort of range of the 20 to 40 metres. But where there's a, a huge opportunity is in what we call floating offshore wind technology. So this is something which has started to materialise uh, earlier. You know, it was, I think, around 2012 that the first floating uh, turbines went out there. That's when you can get into deeper waters, go further out, from the coast, um, but essentially those opportunities are, are almost unlimited um, if you think about the sites around Victoria and Australia's coast. Um, and I think that, as, as I said, this is a, a really ever-changing complex environment in terms of the energy mix of the future. And even though we say that technology might be 10 years away, um, what we're seeing is that 10 years is then all of a sudden becoming seven years as that fast growth um, occurs and we see the costs of those sorts of technologies coming down and, and there being more confidence um, to mature those technologies. Great. And one on the, I guess, the employment opportunity side of things. So Gary Stevens asked um, qualifications needed to be a, a wind turbine generator technician. Hi, Gary. Thanks um, for your question. We are doing a lot of work around that at the moment. So like I mentioned, talking with TAFE um, Federation University, who have the Global Wind Organisation training. There's also the Victorian Skills Commissioner. So we're still, while I haven't got an exact confirmation of, of the type of qualification you might need, uh, that's the conversation we're having right now. And I also did note the Victorian government's put aside money, I think, again, about $6 million for a clean energy skills task force, which is also, um, you know, something we'd very much like to be involved in so we can ensure that offshore wind um, is represented. But you know, at a high level, as I said, it's the mechanical and electrical skills that are typically required, um, you know, there's very high heights, so um, 
very similar to the onshore industry, but obviously the added complexity of being out at sea is typically what we'll be looking at. What are the gaps there and how can we get the right certifications and qualifications in time to service the, the project that we're looking to build? Perfect. Thank you. All right, I will leave it there. Thank you very much for that. Um, there are a few other questions and more trickling in uh, as we go um, that you can possibly respond to while we hear from our other speakers. Thank we'll you. Will do. Thanks. Perfect. Okay, so from offshore wind uh, to hydrogen. So we're going to hear from uh, Jeremy Stone now, who's the non-executive director at J Power. So over to you, Jeremy. You, we cannot hear you, unfortunately, Jeremy. You're you either you don't appear to be muted, but um, we're not we're not picking up your volume. How about that? Is that Perfect. Better? There we okay, go. Sorry yep. about that. Let me just get the slide present. Thank you for the opportunity and also for everyone's time in um, in being here today. Again, I think it shows the interest uh, in the transition we have for for Gippsland into. Uh, a low emissions and clean energy future. Um, so as you mentioned, I'm a non-executive director of J Power La Trobe Valley, and that's the subsidiary of J Power, which is one of Japan's largest utility companies. For a sense of scale, they're about two and a half times the generation capacity of AGL. And in Japan, we're already 50% renewable, mainly through hydro and wind and we invest in a range of clean energy uh, projects around the world, whether it be biomass, hydro, wind, solar, and our topic today, um, hydrogen. So uh, I've got about 12 slides here. I'll get through that in about 10 minutes. It's to give you the, the background of why we're here and, and, and also an update of what we've done and where our future will go. So why, why are we here? How did this project first came about? Well, um, you may recall about 2011, there was a, 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 an accident in Japan, the Fukushima nuclear accident. Um, and at that point, Japan had to rethink about how they were gonna secure a clean and affordable and reliable energy into their market, where once they were heading a little bit more towards nuclear, they had to rethink. And they came up with uh, one of the world's first hydrogen strategies for a country. And they thought about where can they pursue that clean hydrogen and Australia, given the relationship uh, Japan has with Australia in terms of trading and also supply chains. They felt that Australia was the uh, ideal uh, partner. And in Victoria, they saw again that we had not just the, the resources underground, but also the, the technical resources in Gippsland in particular to help them with their energy needs. And if you're not familiar, um, Japan is fairly unique. They don't have many uh, on-ground resources for energy. They import up to 95% of their energy needs and mainly in fossil fuels. So they've got a, quite a big task at hand to hit the clean energy, hit the Paris targets. Well, since that time, way back in 2011, uh, other countries have started to think about their, their energy needs, having a diverse portfolio of clean energy Australia is not uh, alone. So Australia uh, released their clean um, or their hydrogen strategy in December last year. It was uh, all states and territories uh, agreed to this approach. It's technology agnostic, which means in terms of how the hydrogen is uh, developed or how it was uh, produced, as long as it's clean, it was seen as acceptable. And since that time, there's also been the release a few months ago of the, uh, of the technology statement, which targets five areas for further development, uh, two of which, which relate to our project. One is clean hydrogen, and the other is carbon capture and storage, which I'll talk a little bit more about that a little bit later on. It's always uh, lots of questions about that. So in a snapshot, what is this uh, hydrogen energy supply chain pilot project? Well, this is really to prove up that we can produce clean hydrogen in Victoria and safely ship it all the way to Japan. So we have in on the left-hand side of your screen, we have at Latrobe Valley at the Loyang site, we have a coal gasification and refining facility. We then load that gaseous hydrogen into some tube trailers which will then take the gaseous hydrogen down to the port of Hastings at the Blue Scope Steel site, for which we have built uh, Australia's first liquefaction facility. 
So here we take the gaseous hydrogen and cool it to minus 253 degrees centigrade and liquefy it. We then load it uh, onto the ship. And this is a world's first liquid hydrogen carrier. So never before have we been able to transport by ship uh, liquid hydrogen. And then we finally unload the uh, liquid hydrogen at the port of Kobe in Japan. Now this is a half a billion dollar project, $500 million project. So it's fairly substantial. So there are a number of organizations involved uh, in its development. So we have Kawasaki Heavy Industries. We have my company, J Power, Iwatani, Marubeni, Sumitomo, which are all large Japanese companies. And we have AGL here in Australia. We also have the support of the Victorian government, the Australian government, as well as the Japanese government. So quite a large co cohort of organizations. We all get on pretty well. And we have very much a, a shared vision about what we'd like to do for this project, but also for Gippsland. We get asked uh, all the time, um, if you can produce hydrogen from renewable energy, why would you produce it from Latrobe Valley coal? It's a fair question. Uh, and uh, we respond in, in three main areas. Uh, one is urgency. One is scale and one is sustainability. So in terms of urgency, I think we pretty much all agree about where we'd like to head at 2050 in terms of being carbon neutral. So most of the debate is how to get there. And we subscribe to multiple paths to get there, not just one path. And what this project does do is act upon reducing atmospheric CO2 now. So at commercial scale, we estimate this project would save 1.8 million tonnes of CO2 going into the atmosphere now, which is equivalent to around about 350,000 cars. And also, if we do want an export industry as well, we need to recognise that other countries also eye that opportunity. So countries like Brunei and Russia, uh, the Middle East um, and Norway, for example, have their eyes set on a export trade of clean hydrogen. So we need to get our skates on to get moving if we'd like to tackle that market. On the left hand side, in terms of scale, uh, there's plenty of uh, pilot and demonstration projects going on around the world, but we need to scale up quickly, not only to bring the cost of hydrogen down, but also to skill up and to build common infrastructure for a brand new industry, the hydrogen industry. So this project is easily scalable and it can move quickly given the, the progress and given the fact that the, the technologies exist. And on the right hand side about sustainability, at the end of the day, most uh, reports indicate and most research indicates that this form of hydrogen production is the cheapest form. So it, right now there's about 70 million tonnes of hydrogen produced per year without any carbon capture and storage using steam methane reforming. Our approach based on research indicates we're about 30% more expensive than that, given the fact we've got some other, um, we've got carbon capture and storage and other clean and safe approaches to it. They then say there's another 300% increase above that for renewable hydrogen. They estimate that may come down to parity in about 10 years, which will be awesome. But right now, going back to the urgency, we need to move now. So this provides an affordable supply of clean and reliable energy. Also, in terms of sustainability, our form of hydrogen production, some of the byproducts do become feedstocks for other industries. So there is an opportunity in Gippsland through hydrogen production to have other coexisting industries form, such as ammonia, urea, and methanol, DME, building products and even fish proteins. Uh, so that's not part of our scope at the moment, but we do know that uh, around the world, uh, those coexisting industries do exist. And finally, carbon capture and storage, a full scale commercial operation would include carbon capture and storage. So in terms of where we're up to on each of the elements here in Loyang, at, in um, Latrobe Valley, uh, we have our gasification and refining facility that has been built. Construction is complete. We're in the commissioning stage at the moment, uh, all going well. Um, we sh should be operational by the end of the year. Um, so uh, that's quite an exciting achievement um, there. About 150 jobs have been created in the process for which we'll need about 10 or so during its operations. 
And as was uh, mentioned by Erin, you know, we continue to reach out and work with a number of uh, uh, research institutions and learning institutions. So we have uh, projects and partnerships with CSIRO, Federation Uni, for example, looking at the design and its operations about how we can improve that, how we can be more efficient and even safer going forward. In terms of uh, the Port of Hastings at the uh, Blue Scope Steel site, we have Australia's first uh, liquefaction facility and storage facility. Uh, also construction completed um, and we've uh, generated about 60 jobs, direct jobs during its construction and we need some to 10 to 15 uh, during, its, during its operations. And they, uh, our partners down there who have designed and built that also have ongoing relationships with a number of research in institutions, including CSIRO. I mentioned before the, the world's first liquid hydrogen carrier. This was launched last year in December, it got significant, um, very significant worldwide coverage. Um, it's, go, it's just finished its sea trials. Uh, all going well, it should be in Australian waters around about March or April next year. And we would anticipate even more uh, global attention uh, onto this um, situation. So for Gippsland and Victoria, it would be an ideal situation to promote the fact that uh, we're leading in hydrogen production, clean hydrogen production and um, export around the world. So a great opportunity to put ourselves on the map even more. It's a relatively small ship. Again, it's a pilot, it's a trial. Um, so we've got a long way to go to scale this up. And if you look at comparisons with LNG, it's taken about 40 years to get LNG up from, a, from I guess, a thought into a, a global trade. And what we need to do is to, is to speed this proce process up for hydrogen. And shipping, uh, shipping hydrogen is crucial. Um, and that's why we're investing so much money in trying to get this liquid hydrogen carrier. And finally, the, the final part of the supply chain is in Kobe, the port of Kobe in Japan. So once again, this facility has been built. It's undergoing its uh, commissioning at the moment and looking forward to receiving uh, clean hydrogen uh, in the new year. And from there, that will be used, uh, the hydrogen will be used throughout Japan, uh, initially in transportation, but uh, given their, their needs of energy to replace LNG and coal fired power stations, uh, ultimately they see hydrogen being used um, as energy generation with a lot of work being going on right now in designing and building and understanding how um, gaseous generation using either pure hydrogen or ammonia can be used. In terms of where we are and where we're heading, so we're in the bottom green circle down there. So we're in the pilot stage. So this will continue on uh, well into next year. At the same time as that, we are looking at commercial pathways, uh, a great emphasis on off takers. Uh, there's always lots of talk about how to produce hydrogen. There's, uh, in fact, that probably generates the most amount of the discussion and talk. Uh, but we seem, or well, I believe at least, that we need to be looking more closely at how we uh, use the hydrogen, all the research and activities which need to occur to use hydrogen. Uh, I mentioned before about transportation. Uh, that's probably going to be more in heavy vehicle and back to base type vehicles. Also in um, electricity generation in Australia. Uh, I see a great opportunity uh, to inject uh, hydrogen into the existing gas pipelines. Right now, there's a number of demonstration projects underway to inject up to 10% um, gaseous hydrogen into the pipelines, which will have no negative impact, both on the infrastructure, but also the appliances at the other end. And also chemical uh, production. As I mentioned, the 70 million tonnes used now, the bulk of that is for ammonia generation. When we head to a full commercial scale, we will have a, a commercial scale carbon capture and storage system, absolutely. And CarbonNet, which has been worked on in Gippsland at the moment, it's been uh, uh, developed for 10 years, would be that ideal location. I thought I might finish uh, the presentation uh, talking a little bit about carbon capture and storage, because the other question we get asked a lot is about carbon capture and storage. And the questions we're asked are, um, what is it? And uh, we hear that it uh, doesn't work and it's too expensive. So I'd like just to address those quickly as the last slide. So what is it? Carbon capture and storage is not one thing. There's the carbon capture, 
then there's the CO2 transportation, and then the CO2 storage. So Carbonet is responsible for the carbon transfer and the CO2 storage. In terms of it doesn't work, I think the evidence indicates otherwise. It's been around for 45 years. There's about 20 facilities around the world. Uh, three are in construction and uh, 35 more are in various stages of development. The largest carbon capture and storage site is in Western Australia, off the coast uh, of Western Australia uh, as Gorgon, uh, part of an LNG facility. In terms of being too expensive, um, we also indicate that's a case by case situation. Uh, gasification through that process uh, captures the CO2 in high purity, high temperature and high pressure, very much different to a coal fired power station trying to capture CO2. That's the first thing which keeps the cost down in this project, but also in Gippsland, we're sort of blessed with having such an incredible facility as Carbonet so close to our project, which keeps the cost down as well. So with that, I might, uh, I might end. Thank you for the opportunity, Scott, and thank you for your attention and look forward to answering, answering the, the questions. And I see there's quite a few coming through, Scott. So. There, there is, and I think you've preempted uh, a lot of them on this, this CCS slide as well. So there, there's a couple of questions um, regarding uh, the, the, cost, the cost of this and how it, how it would stack up to, to both LNG, if, if that's what you're looking to substitute in, uh, in the Asian markets, but also um, the additional the additional cost premium that comes on from CCS as well. I think if mm. I'm summarising a few of those, right? Yeah. Look, I think um, if you look at the renewable approach uh, early on, renewable was more expensive than its alternatives at the time. So hydrogen, so clean hydrogen right now would be more expensive than LNG. It depends what your aim is. If your aim is to try and clean up and reduce atmospheric CO2, then we need to go on that transitional pathway. And there will be, a, I guess, a premium early on. Um, and, uh, and that's just, that's, that's what it is. In terms of uh, carbon capture and storage, it does add a premium to existing forms of hydrogen production. I mentioned steam methane reforming, uh, which is using gas. They have no CCS. Just out of interest, that produces about uh, 600 million tonnes of CO2 per year. So a great opportunity even for clean hydrogen, whether it be our form of hydrogen with CCS or renewable, um, there's a huge market there immediately for us, but it will come at a premium, initially at least. Thank you. And a bit of a technical question here from Ian. Um, that when you get to that commercial stage, how much coal you'll use for each um, petajoule or tonne or whatever the measure of hydrogen is produced and um, whether you've got an emissions intensity for, for that as well. Yeah, so th that coal number, um, to, it's to be determined, which is why we're doing the pilot, obviously. So uh, obviously, you know, for our own economics, we want to use the least amount of coal as possible, um, obviously, to, to create the, the, the most amount of hydrogen. Um, so that is yet to be determined. In terms of carbon intensity, it's a very good point. So there is a certification scheme being developed by the Australian government, which will actually have the point of origin of, of hydrogen production. So their aim is to go from, from cradle to gate. So, so in other words, that will um, enable any form of hydrogen production to be able to transparently indicate its carbon intensity. Um, so uh, our challenge is to bring that down to uh, as small as possible, um, and that's our intention. So um, again, this pilot will provide us a little bit more information about what that what that is. Uh, the Australian hydrogen strategy does have let's call it rule of thumbs about hydrogen uh, CO2 intensity uh, in in their document uh, as what is the research. But these pilots and demonstrations put a bit more meat on the bone in terms of that. Right. Um, I Two more and then, then we'll wrap up. Um, there was a question here from Ivor around uh, why brown coal and why not black coal, which is a bit drier. Maybe I could reframe that of why, why Gippsland um, for, for doing this. Yeah. Well, it's because we have a carbon capture and storage solution. So at the end of the day, this is not going to fly for anyone, our companies included, as well as the public. If this is just, we'll just take coal anywhere and just create hydrogen, it defeats the purpose. So again, Gippsland is blessed by having this huge uh, reserve of coal, very close to a massive reserve of carbon storage. So Carbonet, they estimate to be 31 gigatons of 
storage out there. And these are depleted oil and gas reserves. So it's sort of a neat solution where we reverse engineer, where we've extracted out the oil and gas in the decades gone past. So it's sort of a neat solution that we can re-inject back into CO2. So short answer is um, we need a CCS solution. Yep. And just, just on that one quickly, um, Ash Hall's just asked around, um, is there any uh, research being done or are you guys looking into any opportunities for reusing the carbon for other products uh, rather than just storage? Absolutely. And we see this as a huge opportunity for, for Gippsland. So uh, CO2 is needed in our world. It's, 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 it's important uh, for our world. It's the excess into the atmosphere, which is the problem here. So we see great opportunities uh, for coexisting industries. So ammonia, urea, Australia imports about a million tonnes of urea per year. So um, this is an opportunity. Uh, methanol, DME, which is a diesel replacement. Uh, we've got uh, fish proteins, building materials. So I guess my own personal vision is I'd love to see a, a whole um, um, coexisting clean energy hub being developed in Gippsland. Uh, it may be hydrogen, it may be the centerpiece, given it provides both the energy as well as some byproducts. But I just see this incredible transformation uh, using the skilled workers we already have there, as well as the supply chain. So quite an exciting future, I think, for, for Gippsland. Right, thank you. Um, there are a lot of questions there which I might direct you to. Tracy has used uh, Lovely Manage and asked me to please ask you about the pipeline, but um, maybe we can come back to that in the wrap up Q and A, or you can you can go to address that one as well. So apologies, Tracy, but we're we're out of time. So thank you very much, Jeremy. Thank you very much, Scott. Thank you, everyone. Cheers. Um, and now we're over to King Arthur. A fantastic name. Um, <laughs> some, when I first first saw that through, I was wondering whether it was a name or, or a title, King. Yeah. Um, his title, though, is the Executive Director of Solus Renewable Energy. So over to you, King. Great. Okay. Thank you very much. And uh, thanks to the Gippsland Climate Change Network and Committee for Gippsland for inviting us along. Uh, I've enjoyed the other presentations. I've actually learned a few things, which is, which is good. Um, I will just kick off my presentation, uh, get it into the right format. Oops. Okay. So uh, Solus Renewable Energy and we're calling our, we've got a number of projects which we're calling Project Repowering Gippsland. So just quickly going to cover who we are, the changing landscape, challenges we've faced, uh, why Gippsland, um, and the Australian Renewable Academy. And just before you do, you might want to uh, change your display settings because uh, we've still oh. got your slide preview happening as well. Oh, okay. Uh, let me do that. Thank you. Is that better? Perfect. Thanks. Beautiful. Okay. Thanks for that. Okay. So who we are just quickly. Uh, so Solus Renewable Energy um, Consulting Group, myself and Michael Begali as Executive Directors. And for our projects in Gippsland, we've uh, set up uh, Solus Gippsland projects, which is made up of Solus plus uh, Brett Singh, who uh, is Marathon Electrical, and also another local uh, family property owner and civils company, which is the Ferguson family. Mm -hmm. So our, our projects are 50% owned by uh, local members of the community. So what's happening and why, why we're in Gippsland? Well, basically is because as everyone would be aware, the landscape is changing with uh, the exit over time of the coal fired power stations and the move into other renewables. So what that uh, represents obviously is some challenges for the community as to how do we transition? How do we have a respectful transition for all of the workers in the area and making sure that the GDP and employment is maintained and that Gippsland does remain the powerhouse in that area. So the challenges for us with our projects was being able to identify the suitable land. Uh, what that means is that it's of low agricultural value, that we don't impinge on neighbourhoods and that we have the right infrastructure available and for us that means transmission. 
So if we have a look and say why Gippsland, so Gippsland, and this was um, confirmed in the state budget um, yesterday, uh, is going to have its own renewable energy zone. And what the advantages of Gippsland is, uh, one, one of the key things is what's known as marginal loss factor, which means of the energy you produce, how much of it does a project get paid for? Um, up around the Mildura area where you'd say, okay, that makes sense, lots of sunshine, let's put a solar farm up there. What the issue up there is that they haven't had sufficient transmission resource or infrastructure and their MLF figures are around the 80% marker. So what that means is every million dollars worth of electricity you produce, you're only going to get paid 800,000. So Gippsland's got the advantage of having excellent infrastructure and therefore anyone who wants to develop a project is going to get to keep a lot more of uh, the energy they're producing in terms of dollars. Second point is the skilled workforce. So as uh, Jane said early on, you know, we've We've been fortunate to be the home of uh, energy in Victoria for almost 100 years now. And uh, we want to make sure that we can transition those staff over time from coal into uh, the renewable energies. Um, so transmission I've already mentioned, uh, which gives us access to what's known as the NEM, uh, which is the National Electricity Market, which basically flows right up the eastern seaboard. So energy produced in Victoria um, in, can in practice be fed into New South Wales, fed into Queensland, fed into South Australia, fed down to Tasmania. So access to that national market is excellent. Um, so I'll move on to the next slide. So in terms of our projects, just at a high level, we've got uh, a project at Perry Bridge, Perry Bridge Solar Farm, uh, which has got its own website. That's currently on 232 acres. It's got the transmission on that side of 66 kV line. And we're putting a solar farm and a battery onto that site. That project uh, should turn soil probably around March to June next year. So we'll actually start construction on that one next year. The second site is a project in Fulham, which is on 400 acres. Uh, it's uh, slightly larger. That's gonna be 80 megawatts of solar plus a battery. And we'd expect that that one will follow three to four months later. We should be able to turn soil on that one. And the large project is what we call Project Gippsland Renewable Energy Park. That project uh, is at the stage where we've been able to acquire the land. So we've got a, uh, in excess of 9,000 acres of land, which is low agricultural value. And it's also uh, working with a group of other developers in terms of having a transmission solution. Uh, that's well advanced. There's been good communication with the state government and good support for that. In, in addition to the land at uh, Gippsland Renewable Energy Park, we've also got, uh, well, this 900's actually just recently gone up to over 3,000 acres, so an additional 3,000 acres um, for Project Amiga, which can feed in through the Gippsland Renewable Energy Park. So with the Gippsland Renew Renewable Energy Park, we're looking at solar and batteries as the first stage, 500 megawatts of solar plus a large battery and uh, looking with, at green hydrogen and other renewable sources over time. So in terms of uh, timescale for these projects, so your lawn has been in the paper as being the likely next coal plant to close down. Time frame for that is somewhere between 2024 and 2028. And we will have uh, our production coming on in time to meet that deadline. I think everyone would be aware of what happened when Hazelwood closed down and what happened to electricity prices. So we're aiming to help fill the gap with those by getting these projects up and running as quickly as possible. Okay. Um, I'll just move through 
these because we're going to run out of time. So really what we see as the way forward is more collaboration by large scale re renewable energy providers. Um, so it won't be just our project. We need to have other projects to justify the build of a large transmission superhighway, as we call it. And that's happening. We've actually got a number of different developers working collaboratively, um, approaching state and federal government, as well as transmission builders. And there should be some good announcements on that in the near term. Um, so in terms of what it means in terms of workforce, so we'll use uh, Perry Bridge as the example. And I'm using a uh, presentation which uh, Samantha True has put together. So this isn't, isn't my work. So I won't claim credit for it. And um, what we're looking at uh, being involved in is what we call the Australian Renewables Academy. So what that will do is act as the central hub for getting various partners together that can deliver the right skilled staff. So how this came about, we had a meeting down in uh, Sale a uh, week before last, met up with uh, Graham Dyer from Dyer's Transport, and we we're talking about the various things we can do and gauging his interest in, you know, moving his fleet over time towards a renewable energy source, which uh, he was positive about. But um, being the, the practical businessman that he was, he said, it's great, we can move to, uh, you, know, you know, electric vehicles or more likely hydrogen powered vehicles for heavy transport. But uh, the number one thing you need as a transport provider is to have your trucks on the road. And therefore you need to have people skilled at actually working on those trucks. If they're powered by hydrogen, we need people who are used to have the skill set to uh, work on hydrogen powered trucks. So it really does get back into what uh, the other presenters have said about working with the TACE, working with the unis, working with large businesses to work out what those skill sets are and making sure we have uh, the training in place, the people in place, so that you've got a, a full supply chain when you bring in these new generation sources. Um, so this is a fairly extensive list of the types of uh, jobs which will be involved in this new renewable energy uh, environment, which we're all moving into. And you can see it covers a lot of different areas. It's gonna impact on a lot of different types of jobs. And we need to make sure that there's suitable training programs in place, well coordinated. Um, so if we look at, I'm not even gonna to attempt to explain this, but we've got lots of different types of people working together with new skill sets. Uh, which will enable us to go ahead and build our renewable energy resources. So if we took take a look at what we need, so we're going to have different groups which will help us uh, put this together. And besides the TAFEs and the unis, you need to really get back into secondary schools and get people used to the language of what's required so that when the kids are in their sort of... Uh, year 10, 11, 12, they can know what types of skill sets and what type of qualifications they're going to need to get into the new workforce. Um, making sure that people can get accreditation, uh, TAFE and university courses, as well as specialised training organised by industry type. Um, okay. So, and you can see the various levels of qualifications available there, whether it's apprenticeships, trade qualifications, or actually getting into degrees and postgraduate type studies. Okay. So there's different uh, levels as well, which will be required. So professional specialist level, trades level, semi-skilled trades assistance and low skilled. So if you look at uh, a solar farm, um, We've got people, you know, if, if you look at the number of panels on our solar farm, so we have on our, on our Fulham farm, we'll have about 160,000 panels, which all need to be bolted onto the stands there. So you're going to have a lower skill level people being able to do that job, but still having to be skilled up to understand what they're working with trades assistants, trades people, 
at the top end, you've got the professionals actually working out the specialist engineering and the specialist control systems, which potentially could include things like artificial intelligence. So there's a whole range of different skills which are going to be required. And really what all of this uh, is going to deliver is those economic benefits, which the other guys have spoken about as well. So in employment opportunities, as well as the use of local services, food, accommodation, retail in the Gippsland region. Um, that's pretty much where I was finishing up there. Perfect. Thank you very much, King. Um, Paul Stansfield had a question for you, but he only got your name out in the question. So, Paul, maybe if you want to retype that and put it in, um, that that might that'll be good, and we can we can come back to that in the broader the broader Q and A. Mm -hmm. um, but otherwise, we haven't had any any questions come in. So, if you here we go. Oops. Um, we've got a, a general a general question um, for for later on, which we might tackle in the group session. So thank you very much, King. We'll come back to, to questions at the, the end. Right, thank you. Brilliant. And now over to our final speaker before we have the, the general Q&A. So we've got uh, Chris Barfoot, who's the project officer at the Latro Valley Community Power Hub uh, from the Gippsland Climate Change Network. Over to you, Chris. Hi, thank you. Uh, for those who don't know me, I'm actually uh, an ex Hazelwood person. I'm actually third generation coal and uh, power station worker. So. I'm one of the people that have made the transition. And so I'm here to talk to you a bit about that and about some of the things that are coming up because there's so much more happening here than we've just seen today. So not only have we seen the ones that are there, but there are things like the Maryvale Waste to Energy Plant coming up. There's a solar farm next to Hazelwood, another one at Toon Gabby, there's another one at Mafra. There's a 200 megawatt battery about to be installed at Loyang A the Delburn Wind Farm, the Mariners connection to Tasmania coming through. And then as King just mentioned, the Perry's Bridge Fulham and then potentially the Ramiak solar farm as well. This is a real change. This is a massive change in what we've been experiencing. Also, as the mines are closing, we are opening up more opportunity. And one of the big ones we keep hearing about is that we would move to being in a pit lake scenario. If we are going to go to pit lakes, it makes so much more sense to do something like a floating solar system on it. Why? Firstly, it gives you far better return because you get about a 15% increase in the efficiency of the panels because they're actually, uh, they're actually cooled. It also reduces the evaporation by about 30%. And so you don't waste that really precious resource that we do need. And it opens up more agriculture opportunities as, as part of that. In terms of sizing, Hazelwood mine alone could host about 780 megawatts. If you look at the pits that comprise the Yalor mine, it could host over a thousand megawatts. These type of jobs could, you know, these type of projects could provide substantial work for people that have been retrenched as part of the transition that's coming. Second one we wanna just have a quick chat to people about is the Arena Osnet project. This is a project which is designed around demonstration of distributed energy management systems. As part of this, we will be installing up to about 16 megawatts of solar and about 11 megawatts of batteries inside the Osnet region. This is a project which is open to councils, businesses and other large, large electric users in, Victoria, uh, in Gippsland. There is a criteria, 66,000 hours, kilowatt hours is your minimum power use and you've got to have roof space of greater than 350 square metres and a tariff greater than 15 cents a kilowatt hour. A particular business we just did in Morwall of late, we were able to demonstrate an $8,000 a year saving with no capital cost and with that system being gifted after 10 years. GCCN is the link to Osnet for this project. And so if you would like to explore this option, please contact us and that. On the smaller scale, we recently had a successful in getting funding as part of the new energy jobs fund. And so we are looking at some smaller projects. And so if there are community groups or if there are small businesses that would be interested in investigating this, please get in touch with us as well. But the main point I just want to make today is really about this transition that we are. 
It is real. It is happening. It is now. We need to develop those skills. We need the maritime skills. We need the technical skills. But we also desperately need to pivot our heavy industrial base to making components for the renewable industry. But we also need to have and make sure that not only do we produce renewable energy, but that we incorporate production of products using it. We need to have those high energy intensity green energy project, projects such as hydrogen, metal productions, and many more. Now, this is really critical because one of the things people forget is that when you look at a power station, it wasn't uncommon that they would have up to a thousand employees. A solar farm will have a handful. A wind farm will have slightly more. There is still a very large deficit in jobs. And this has to be filled. And the best way to fill it is by utilizing that renewable energy to make a green product that can be sold into the market. So that's one of the major things we just want to cover. As we said, we mentioned the two projects coming up. If people are interested or want to investigate their chances of opportunities for solar and batteries, we will be welcome to discuss that with you. Uh, my contact details are sitting there and uh, that will basically do. Brilliant. Thank you, Chris. Um, nice and nice and prompt too. I just so. decided to keep that one short so there is time for the Q&A for all the other questions that are coming in. Lovely. Um, all right, so if we can bring all of our speakers back on, that would be great. Um, and we can have a general conversation. Uh, so there was a question that we did promise Tracy that we'd come back to Jeremy on your front. Um, regarding the pipeline and just um, whether you'd need other industries uh, to utilise the, the pipeline to, to share the cost and, and make it viable or whether your project alone could help support that. Uh, which pipeline? Is that the hydrogen, gaseous hydrogen pipeline? I believe that's the one, Tracy. Yeah, Rich, sorry. yeah so, the, so look at the moment, uh, we're doing our uh, assumptions and modelling, assuming that the hydrogen pipeline um, we would pay for. Uh, we don't know where that's going to yet. The port location for commercial scale is not decided yet. So we've got to work out where that is first. But there will be a gaseous hydrogen pipeline needed for export. But I think that's the beauty of this project. It's actually um, a lot of the work we're doing is actually going to be usable by any form of uh, hydrogen production. So once we hit the gate of our project site in terms of its production, the hydrogen pipeline, liquefaction, uh, the ports, uh, the ships are all used by any form of hydrogen production. So if we can make it renewable from uh, Star of the South or any other form of, uh, of renewables, that would be awesome. And they can um, share into the common infrastructure. That'd be, that'd be a good outcome, actually. All right. Tracy's just said no. She's referring to the one um, offshore for CO2. Ah, okay. So the CO2, um, so carbon net is not set up just for our project. So they um, are working and already uh, in deep discussions with other carbon intensive industries around Gippsland and around uh, Victoria. So their vision is to uh, actually secure the CO2 from a whole range of industries. So not just us. Yep. Thank you. All right, and um, I guess a, a question for me, now that you've heard each other talk and Chris has given a really good overview of all the other things happening in, in Gippsland, I could just guess on that, that collective front, if each of you can comment for a minute or so, just around, I guess, where you see the, the biggest opportunity for Gippsland, but also what's needed um, to realise that, that opportunity as well. So um, I'm going to throw to you first, Erin, because you're right next to my face on Zoom. So over to you. Oh, yeah, I think um, Jane touched on a really interesting point in her introduction. And what it what really is interesting is the fast pace of planning, uh, the work that's being done, as I said, by the likes of the market, market operator, the federal government, the state government, um, all of the people who have an interest in the electricity sector, the Energy Security Board, um, many people might not know, but there's currently work going on to fully reform the market. Um, I was listening into a summit earlier this week that was talking about, do we steer away from a national electricity market into state-based um, approaches? And you might see that New South Wales, for example, has come up with a very strong renewable plan of how they're going to uh, 
basically coordinate the generation and the transmission and all of these sorts of things. So what I can see is a huge amount of conversations and planning happening, but perhaps a disconnect between how that aligns with local community objectives for their own region, um, how they want to see this play out, this new investment come, these plans made. And I'd really encourage, look, it is super complicated. And I've said to other people, I mean, this is part of my job, so I read about it. But if I was doing this in my spare time, I, I just wouldn't have enough. So I think as a collective, we need to keep this conversation up. And it's why I applaud this um, forum being held and really um, ensure that we're getting the best of the local knowledge to ensure that projects that are being proposed and developed are done in, in line with um, the industry's specific needs and skills as well as community expectations. Great. Jeremy, you're, you're next on my clock. Uh, look, rotation. that's a good question. I, um, again, going back to Jane's earlier comments, um, we sort of know where we're heading in, in Gippsland, particularly with the coal-fired power stations. So it's been well broadcast about they will be closing down over the years and decades. Um, so if Gippsland wants replacement industries, they actually have to put their hand up and fight for it. It's very competitive to get uh, hydrogen or other clean energy sources going. So, so we need to uh, demand it. We need to fight for it. And I think the uh, the cluster which Jane was talking about before is absolutely crucial to get ourselves on a, an Australian and world scale to be leaders in this area, which I think Gippsland has that opportunity to be. And what a great story that could be for Gippsland, where we've our history may have been in coal-fired power stations, but what an incredible story for Gippsland and Victoria if we can show how we can uh, transition to these whole range of clean energy sources to actually not just survive, but to thrive. And I think that's the opportunity in front of us, but we are gonna have to fight very hard for it because there are many other states and territories wanting that sort of money and that investment. Great. King? Good. Yeah, no, I, I, I agree basically with what, what's been said. Um, for us in particular, what we're looking for is an extension to the transmission network. So what that gives us, we've got the land, we've got uh, investors um, from basically from all over the world, as well as Australia, wanting to build large projects. Um, we're, we're talking sort of around the two and a half billion dollars worth of projects that have been proposed for the large, you know, Gibson Renewable Energy Park. And they're companies that have got the expertise, so they can bring it in and make it commercial scale from day one. So really, it's that connection into the into the grid. As I said, those discussions are ongoing, and they've had good support. But it's a matter of you know putting your money where your mouth is, I suppose. If it's not too rude, and actually making it happen. So um, once that happens, I think what we'll see for Gippsland is what's happened up in New South Wales, where their renewable energy zone, they were looking for $3 billion worth of investment and had $27 billion worth of people put their hand up to say yes, please. So that's, that's the size of the opportunity for Gippsland. It's real. We've got the resources. We've got the people. We just need that uh, missing link, which is a transmission link. Great. Jane, pass the microphone over to you. Thanks, Scott. Uh, it's it's really timely. This coming Monday, we've engaged an independent consultant to help pull a bit of work together for the region because what's been identified is we don't probably have a, a joined up vision and prospectus for energy. So um, a number of industry members um, and community members are, are um, sitting around the table with this consultant to define that scope. And I think that's going to be a really good platform and it will pick up some of the, the priorities that have been discussed today, including the hydrogen cluster and renewables and where to from here. So what would be great with this particular forum is to come back to this forum and um, present you know, the scope and the thinking and um, create a further conversation on that piece of work because what Jeremy's saying is so true. I've been sitting on a number of discussions over the last couple of months with um, TAS networks and, and other interstate sort of um, energy groups. And everyone is talking about being the energy powerhouse. And, you know, so everyone wants a piece of that pie. And we've got a real strong advantage that um, has really got to be leveraged, but quickly. And Chris. 
Yeah, absolutely agree with everybody on this one. I mean, we are in a unique position. We have a great opportunity. We have everything in place. We've just got to drive hard for this. We've got to understand that there is a very different market in the world, which is affected by carbon, which we don't see. And if you understand that, you understand then that, you know, things like green steels and that actually have the value add price into the European market. If we can get ourselves thinking that way, we make a huge difference. A second point just to make is that in terms of community license. Now, I find particularly with many, many solar farms, they have a great you know, impact initially as people do construction and then it fades off. But if you do something like, for example, reserve some small amount of land on there and actually build uh, factories or facilities that can buy behind the meter power, then the jobs stay local. You then create a whole new industry and a whole new opportunities. And that, look, I think this is the most amazing time we've ever faced in Latrobe Valley, and I'm looking forward to it. Great to hear the optimism among all of you. Um, a couple of other questions have filtered through, which we might try and get to. Um, whether any any of the projects that we've talked about have had investment backing uh, through the Clean Energy Finance Corporation at all? Uh, um, I yeah. can answer for, oh, sorry. Okay, <laughs> for okay. our, um, no, our, um, our investment at the moment is coming from um, basically superannuation funds. So um, Copenhagen Infrastructure Partners are our investors. Um, what I would say is there's significant interest from Australian super funds in projects like ours. Uh, I think they're, they're watching for, for policy signals and all of the things we're talking about to, um, to go forward. But, but certainly from our perspective, it's, it's mostly the super funds and the big institutional investors um, that do have a lot of interest. Mm -hmm. Right, thanks. Sorry, Aaron. Uh, yeah, so for our Perry Bridge and Fulham uh, sites, we've got the Clean Energy Finance Corporation will be involved in both of those projects. Um, we have to fight, we have to sign the, uh, we haven't got to financial close, so I can't go into any more details on that, but uh, they've been very supportive. Yeah, and we don't, not from them, but we've got private investors, uh, government investors, but a lot of superannuation funds and big banks are very interested, you know, to get involved when the time comes to go to the next stage. So uh, it's all looking good. Great, and I saw there was a, a question before uh, that came up, and I'm not sure if anyone will know the answer. To this this might be one for you, Chris or Jane. In terms of, um, we've we've talked a lot about some of the larger scale side of things, but um, is there opportunities for funding at the smaller scale side of projects for, for these sort of projects across Gippsland as well? Yeah, from from our viewpoint, there's a huge amount of opportunity. The, the Mondo project is one that gives us an, a large amount of uh, funding available to us. We're also setting up our own funds, our own uh, revolving fund that we're establishing. To be honest, look, getting money into green industries at the moment, it is not hard. The, you know, the the message is getting out there through the boards and the investors very much that people don't want to be involved in the fossil fuel industry into the future. So realistically, getting funding, not hard. So, so I can uh, support that comment as well. We've, through uh, people that are investing in our projects, they're looking for smaller scale as well. Yeah, their, their version of small scale is probably five megawatts, which is, you know, five, five and a half million dollar projects. So not large in terms of utility, but uh, that's the type of thing which communities could possibly get together and put uh, proposals forward for. I suppose, Scott, when you have a look at the Victorian budget, there is significant, and Commonwealth, there's significant funding available for clean energy technologies and opportunities. Um, I think for Gippsland, the, the challenge is around that balance, isn't it? Because obviously we need some significant major scale, big scale projects to offset the economic loss that's gonna be impacted with the closure of our traditional sectors. Um, and and balanced with you know those smaller sort of opportunities as well. So it's about how do we get the scale right so that we don't sort of see our GDP, our jobs, our vibrant communities uh, go backwards. In actual fact, they go forward, and our standard of living continues to increase and grow. Great. Um, another another question here, which is one about I guess. Uh, 
competition for resources in a region. So flagging, I guess, Gippsland as a, a food bowl um, and the, I guess, historic need of uh, the energy industry requiring lots of, lots of water. And so just whether there's any trade-offs um, that are being considered between um, the, the other big industry uh, in Gippsland in terms of agricultural production and the, uh, the new energy sector that we're looking at as well, if anyone's got thoughts or comments on that. I've paraphrased Evor a bit there, but away you go. I think um, this is really important for the region. We can't put all our eggs in one basket. Um, it's probably caused us some pain uh, having sort of an imbalance in terms of sector. So obviously diversification is really critical. And, um, you know, I've had a number of discussion with the water corporations um, across the region in terms of, you know, how do we protect and value the water? Um, you know, how do we leverage water for um, best and highest value use? Uh, how do we protect certain landscapes across the region as well to continue to sort of grow produce? So there's a lot of thinking in that space and there's a bit of work, uh, an opportunity to do some refresh on the Gippsland investment prospectus, which I think is a real catalyst to sort of identify and start to capture where's, where are those pockets of value, whether it's sort of energy production, food production, manufacturing, whatever it might be, where are those pockets and how do they sort of sit together so that um, it's a balanced approach and um, we're not sort of putting all our eggs in the one basket as, as I said before. Uh, Scott, just on uh, water consumption. So hydrogen, the production of hydrogen requires water. So um, the Australian hydrogen strategy sort of gives a rule of thumb about nine litres of water per kilogram of hydrogen. Mm -hmm. So that gives some sense of the water needs, but that would still be, well, I guess it depends on how big your commercial scale um, hydrogen are, but that would be a fraction of what's used by the power stations. So um, I think that's a positive thing. And going back to what uh, Jane said, we, we, we need to have a, a diverse range of industries in Gippsland um, and just use the resources wisely we have. I was just going to add quickly that in terms of our projects, one of our development guidelines is that we only use low grade agricultural land. We don't use good quality farming land. And that's not based on me walking around the paddock saying work, whether I think it is or isn't. We actually do get a agricultural value assessment done independently for every project. And if it doesn't come up with the right figures, uh, then that land is deemed as not suitable for our projects. Great. Perfect. All right, I might draw the Q&A to a close there. There has been more questions come in. Um, what we'll endeavour to do is have, have those answered for you and then they'll be shared uh, with the recording and the slides from the presentations as well. So thank you all very much for your questions and active engagement, but also to all our speakers as well. I'm going to throw back to Jane just to wrap things up and then maybe give people a heads up of uh, where to from here and how to engage. Thanks, Scott. Really appreciate it. It's um, been a really exciting discussion and thank you everyone for coming along this, uh, this afternoon. I think um, as the conversation took hold, I was sort of writing down, you know, the unique competitive advantage that Gippsland's in, in terms of its energy opportunity. And uh, things that come to mind, obviously, was skilled workforce, the transmission infrastructure connecting to the grid, suitable land, uh, strong return on investment, natural resource, uh, whether that be coal, wind, etc., the carbon capture in our backyard, social license and supply chain, already supply chain, are some of the things that sort of resonated very strongly in terms of our value. So there's a significant opportunity here and um, it's not just in clean energy, there's opportunity happening right across the region. So it's an exciting time. There's investment happening and um, projects happening as well, which is really positive. And um, from a, a local's point of view, it's uh, encouraging to see you know, such wonderful projects um, happening across the region. I just want to thank our, our guest panel. So Chris, thank you. Chris Barfoot, thank you very much. Aaron Coldham from Star of the South, King Arthur from Solace Renewable and Jeremy Stone from J Power. Thank you so much. Um, Scott, so nice to see you um, sort of back in the region here in Gippsland. We really appreciate your hosting today. It's been wonderful and wish you all the best with your project too at the university. So thank you. Uh, the intent from here is to continue these sorts of 
forums on a regular, semi-regular basis, sort of thinking quarterly, where we'll just have an energy flavour for the next 12 months and we'll run some forums. And it would be great to have, you know, some of the um, potential future discussions around carbon net, but also invite the generators in to talk about their transition plans to a cleaner future. Because uh, there's been some really significant announcements like with AGL last week around their battery sort of initiative. So we'll invite them into a series. Also like to close in just thanking the Gippsland Climate Change Network as well. It's been a great opportunity to work together and continue these sorts of conversations. So have a wonderful afternoon and we look forward to the next session. Thanks all. Thank you.